Welcome, everyone. Very excited for today's event. My name is Kevin Petrie. I'm Vice President of Research for Eckerson Group and your host for today. So today our topic is a hot one. It's building data products with data mesh and data fabric. So before we begin, I want to quickly walk through what you can expect over the next few hours. CDO TechFent is a three-hour virtual event. It consists of a keynote, technology panel, breakout sessions, and topic tables. In a few moments, our president, Wayne Eckerson, will kick off the keynote. He's going to be joined by Paul Rankin, data expert and head of data management at Roche Diagnostics. So we'd like to recognize our data fabric and data mesh partners who helped make this event possible. They are Cogenity, Prometheum, and Starburst. Be sure to visit our resource hub to find more information about their strategy, their customers, and products. Also, our media partners who help promote the event are EM360, Solutions Review, Real-Time Insights, Datanami, and Bark. Thank you, one and all. A little bit more about Eckerson Group, which is hosting this event. We are a research, consulting, and vendor advisory firm that specializes in data and analytics. You've probably read our research, and that's why you're here, but you may not know that our consulting division works with a lot of clients, big and small, brand name and boutique, to develop data strategies, modernize data architectures, and build data governance programs, among many other things. Contact us if you'd like to learn more. So here's a sneak preview of our next event in December. We're already very excited about this. It will focus on an emerging class of analytics tools for power users. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Wayne Eckerson. Wayne's been a thought leader in the data and analytics field since the early 1990s, and he's the president of Eckerson Group. I personally was a client of Eckerson Group for several years. I was so impressed, I convinced Wayne to hire me about three and a half years ago. He will be joined by Paul Rankin, head of data management at Roche Diagnostics. Paul has 15 years of experience in designing and delivering data integration and BI solutions for a large number of uh, national and international organizations. Paul currently lives and works in Switzerland. All right, Wayne, over to you. Great, thank you, Kevin. Let's dive right in, folks. There's a lot to cover today. Uh, this keynote is divided into three sections. First, I'm gonna give a market overview because there's a lot of confusion about data products, data mesh, and data fabric, what they are, how they're the same, how they're different. So we have to cover a lot of ground there, uh, I think, to make some sense of it all. But then we're gonna get down to reality and talk to uh, Paul. I'm gonna ask him some questions about uh, data mesh. He's become kind of the data, the poster boy for data mesh in many respects. And I must admit, I've kind of been a doubter, self-professed doubter, but he's convincing me that there's some real stuff here. Uh, so we're gonna dive into uh, the intricacies of how do you implement the data mesh. And then finally, I'll come back and talk about products in the space, although it's a little odd in this case because Almost every product in our domain, data and analytics, could qualify as a data mesh, data product, or data fabric. Uh, so that will be a little bit shorter than normal. So what's interesting is that in talking about data products to many people at events and, and reading things online, I, I've discovered there's a lot of confusion about what they are. Are they dashboards? Are they code? Are they ML models, analytic components, data components, SQL queries, or data sets? I'm like, well, yes, <laughs> I guess, but haven't we all always had these things, right? So I started to ask myself, if we've already had these things, these data assets, why are we calling them data products now? What's really changed? What's new? So I started to read a little bit. Uh, this is uh, from a blog by Jean-Georges Perrin. And he listed these characteristics of a data product, and I'm not going to read them, but they all look great to me. But I think, well, shouldn't everything that we build have these characteristics? Shouldn't every data asset exhibit these traits? And I can certainly add a hell of a lot more other traits that I would want these assets or products to exhibit. Like, you know, they should be targeted and defined, easy to build and document, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm still scratching my head thinking, well, is a data product just a data asset done right? Should everything we develop be a data product or is there a difference between what we've all always done and what we're now calling a data product? So this got me thinking again, 
you know, about real products in the real world. And where do you find these? You find them in a store most of the time, right? And how do people buy these real products? Well, you know, they go to a store, they browse the aisles, they examine the products, they look at the ingredients, they compare those products to others, find the one they want, add it to a cart, purchase it, take it home. Easy, yeah. Products should be easy to find, examine, buy, and take home. And that started me thinking some more. Shouldn't data products work like this? I think so. So what do these types of products have in common? Real products. Well, I started thinking, what's a real product? What are some of the characteristics of a, a product you would go to a store and buy? Well, they're standardized. They're always the same, no matter when you buy them, whether today, tomorrow, or three months from now, or three years from now, they have the same ingredients and components, and they're created the same way every time. So you have some guarantee of what you're getting, right? They also probably have a SKU, store keeping unit. They're also packaged with information that makes it easy for the target audience, the target shopper to make a decision and make a selection. They're also shoppable. I'm not sure if that's a word, but it works here, which means that the product should be easy to find, easy to compare with other products, easy to acquire or purchase, which, in essence, means they should be available in a store, right? Because a store makes all those things possible. Finally, they should be deliverable. Uh, obviously, if it's a grocery store uh, or a retail outlet, you're going to bring the product home with you in your car, but that is a means of shipment. If it's an online store, users should be able to select when it gets delivered, where it gets delivered, and through what shipper, you know? and uh, the speed with which that gets done, and the cost too. And then finally, a product is returnable, which means that if the product doesn't meet customer expectations or federal or state guidelines and standards, it should be able to be returned. So there's an implied contract to a real, quote unquote, real product. So that brings me to data product. So what is a data product? Now, this is a little bit of, uh, I think, <laughs> perhaps an unorthodox definition, but bear with me here. So I think a data product is a data asset that has all the characteristics of something that can be bought and sold to people you do not know. Now, we can argue. <laughs> in fact, I'm curious what Paul is going to think of this definition in our panel that follows this. But to me, a data product, like a real product in the real world, is transactional, and it has the characteristics that we just went through. It's standardized, packaged, shoppable, deliverable, and returnable. And as I've implied, and this is a little bit bold here, I think it's in a data store. Now, I know people are going to argue with me that not every data product is going to be in a data store, and they're right. But I do think the two are inextricably linked. Uh, and if you're really serious about creating and producing data products, you need a data store. Because once you put a data asset into a data store, it's going to take on all new characteristics that are important for you, the consumers of that product who are going to use it. Well, let's go through that a little bit. And I should say, well, what is a data store? Because as I said, I think they're inextricably linked. You can call them data stores or data marketplaces. They're essentially a website or a cloud data platform that enables data providers and data consumers to exchange data in a frictionless manner. And I think the operative word here is frictionless. Today, there's way too much friction, even if you've got a data catalog between the person who wants a data asset or a data product and the person who's providing it. At least that's what I've seen in my experience. So I think, in my humble opinion, if your goal is to produce data products, which I know that's the goal of a lot of companies now, I think you need a data store. But there is a problem here, and we'll get to that in a second. Why do you want a data store? Just to drill down a little bit, because I think it forces data producers to do a number of things up front. It forces people who create data assets to turn them into data products. And how do they do that? Well, first, they have to define upfront who can view and access the product, right? So define access rights. 
it forces them to talk, think about how users want to use that product and subscribe to it, what they can consume for how long at what frequency, how they want it to be delivered, the channels, the targets, the formats, the cost or the charge for the products, if any. Just because it's in a store doesn't mean you have to charge for it. Uh, in fact, most data products that are shared internally are probably not going to be charged for, although some may want to apply chargeback costs, but not all. There's going to be an implied contract, terms of use. What the consumers of these products, what are you going to allow them to do with that? Are you only going to allow them to use it internally? Can they use it externally? Can they create derivative products from it? Can they use the product to create commercial products? Terms of use. And then finally, a contract, um, terms of service. What if the product doesn't meet expectations or standards or predefined agreements, what happens then? So these are all things that the store kind of forces the asset creators to think about in advance before they publish. Now, there are many different types of data stores. There are external data marketplaces, which uh, I think a lot of us know about. There's seller hubs, buyer hubs. And the thing that we really want to focus on today are these internal data marketplaces which basically don't exist. And I'm gonna make a case today that this is what the industry needs. This is what our industry is missing. Now, a lot of us are familiar with external data marketplaces. There's a lot of different types out there, as you can see here. Most of us are familiar with Amazon data marketplace in our space, right? But these are for external consumption of data products. They're not for internal data sharing within an organization. There are some data store platforms out there, not a lot. Uh, and most of them are geared to external data marketplaces right now or seller hubs, you know, people who provide data for a living and make money off that. What we don't see today yet, I'm just starting to see the trickle of interest in doing this, is uh, platforms for delivering data stores. Now, there are a lot of potential places where we'll start to see internal data marketplaces or stores come from. Cloud data platforms like Snowflake and Databricks already have uh, data marketplaces, not quite geared internally, kind of, sort of, but not great at it. I think data catalogs will be a natural play here, as well as data pipeline vendors. And some of the seller hubs like Harbor, Revelate, and Narrative are already realizing that maybe the biggest opportunity is not external marketplaces or seller and buyer hubs, but actually internal data marketplaces. So stay tuned. I think this is going to be an interesting area in the next couple of years. So getting back to our original premise, I do think there is a difference, a subtle but fundamental difference between a data asset and a data product. And we've kind of covered a lot of this. From a scope perspective, I think data assets are generated for internal consumption whereas a data product is generated for external consumption. And by external, I don't always mean by consumption by people outside the company. By external, I mean data sharing across organizational boundaries, whether those are internal or external. Uh, I don't know about you, but we consult for a lot of organizations and every company we go into, there are data fiefdoms and data does not pass through those boundaries very easily. And they really need a better mechanism than they have now to bridge those organizational boundaries. Uh, from a request perspective, data assets are interaction, whereas a data product is transaction. So how do you request a data asset? Well, you pick up the uh, phone and call your data analyst or email them or submit a ticket. Or if you're more formal, create a project request or proposal. Whereas a data product, the request is transactional. You go to the store, and you buy it or acquire it. For a data asset, you can discover assets in a data catalog if your company is so fortunate to have one. For a data product, that's a data store. And I think it's a little different than a data catalog, although they're close. Access rights. Well, with the asset, ideally it's predefined once that asset is created, but it, in most companies, you know, it's not. <laughs> so you have to request access to it. In the data product, 
that access is always predefined. There may be some cases where you've been locked out and you want access and you're gonna knock on the door. But in most cases, people have to define upfront who's going to access that, that product. With metadata, uh, you've got descriptions of the asset. With a data product, you have subscriptions. Who can access what content at what frequency for what duration to be delivered through what channel uh, in what format to what target? Right, those things have to be defined upfront, uh, either fixed or as options. From a contract perspective, ideally a data asset has a service level agreement, but a data product, the agreement is a little bit more tangible and hopefully meaty. It's more of a product guarantee with terms of usage and terms of service, which we'll talk about in a second. Governance for a data asset, it's more about a project. You know, you kick off a project, you run the project and you complete the project. Whereas with a data product, it's more of a product management. It's a program that get that's continuous and you have to uh, iterate uh, over and over again and have various investment cycles that go with that. So it's a very different mindset. It's project versus program really. So, the combination of a data product and a data store, I think, provides many benefits. The biggest one uh, is that it saves a whole bunch of time. Every company we go into, I, I see so many business users suffering from time that they must spend fulfilling requests for data assets. <laughs> and the people who they're fulfilling those requests for, oftentimes, you know, the product consumer has to wait for days, weeks, or months to get get access to that data, right? I'm sure you guys have experienced this yourself. The product owner, you know, rather than an asset, there's more product planning uh, involved. You need a more of a product planning mindset. Because of the store for a consumer, the, it's easier to find, browse, compare, evaluate, and acquire data assets. Uh, for product managers, the store actually makes it easier to evaluate usage and demand across multiple products and easier to publish, enhance, and retire those data products. For data leaders, the combination reduces data silos, re requires the business to govern its assets better uh, and more proactively. And for executives, this creates a culture of da data sharing. It, it really does break down the silos. And from a strategic perspective, it also gives them the opportunity to create an industry-wide community around data if they start to externalize their products and create an external data marketplace for their industry. So how do you create a data product? Well, this is a very involved process, uh, as I'm sure you, you all know. Um, and if you're on the vendor side of this discussion here, you probably live this if you're in the marketing department. So I'm not gonna go through each of these points here uh, but I will touch on elements of them. Uh, for instance, in product development, we're going to talk about architecture. We'll talk a little bit about metadata, number three, and we'll talk about governance, number four. And we've already talked about number five, uh, product provisioning. I think we need to move beyond provisioning, which is kind of, I want to request something and I have to wait for it to be given to me, to a data stores we've talked about. So let's talk about product packaging. So I think there are layers of metadata in this whole process. So when a developer creates an asset, they are automatically going to create metadata. Who created it? Who owns it? What is it? When was it created? How big is it? What's the schema? You know, where, where did it come from and where is it stored? Okay, that's just by default almost. And if you're lucky to have a data catalog, when you put the asset or register it up there, it's gonna bring a whole bunch of additional metadata uh, tags. For instance, you know, this record or this data set has PII data. You're gonna be able to see who's using that asset, both people and downstream applications. What's the quality rating? What are related assets that I might be interested in? Is it certified by our governance team? How are people rating it? What are reviews that people are leaving behind? Can I take a look at some sample data? And then can I request access to it? That's usually what you can do in a data catalog. 
But when it gets into a store, I think you accumulate even additional metadata. First of all, the brand, you know, who, what group, product team, division, department or company is producing this data product. Just like you, when you go into a store, you pick up a can of soup, you wanna know who the maker is. I think every data product should have SKU and a version number, right? If we're gonna standardize these products and make them really products, they should probably have a SKU and version number. We've talked about subscription and distribution options. Uh, who can access uh, what content for how long and what frequency, ship to where and what format, over what channel. Terms of service and terms of use, that's the contract, bi-directional contract. What are the obligations of the data producer? What are the obligations of the data consumer? What's the pricing, if any? Is there a cost? Is there a chargeback cost or is it being provided for free? Uh, and who can access this, most importantly? Uh, you have to set that up front. Who can view it in the data store? Who can uh, subscribe to it? What portions of the product can they subscribe to? Can they view it only in the platform or can they download it for consumption? All those things need to be defined up front. Uh, and then product usage. Uh, the data store platforms track who's using, who's downloading, who's subscribing to these products. And that information is extremely valuable to help you understand what products are popular and which are not. So you can retire the ones that are not or reconstruct them so they are popular. Well, I think this metadata is all additive. Product governance. Uh, this is a complicated little workflow. I'm not gonna go through it all, but just like it takes a village to raise a child, it takes <laughs> a number of teams and a number of governance boards to create a data product as you can see here, uh, especially one that's delivered externally, you're gonna, probably gonna get in your DevOps team, you're gonna get operations involved and you're gonna need a product review board to understand uh, if you wanna publish this product and produce it, a technical review board to uh, evaluate whether it's hitting the standards that, that you need. And it's an iterative cycle. So once customers get their hands on it, you want to gather their feedback so you can enrich the product or modify it to better meet their needs. You want feedback from the operations team that's tracking the systems usage here to understand what errors are happening. Uh, is the product being delivered with the quality and consistency and performance that is expected? Okay, so two thirds of this uh, event are focused on data mesh and data fabric. So we're going to get to that now. So this is uh, the evolution of data architecture. We've come a long way from the 1970s where data architecture is really just operational reporting, but we quickly found that was too limited. You're only reporting on a single internal operational application at a time for the most part. So in the 90s, we introduced data warehousing, uh, and that's great. Now we can analyze all of our data uh, in an integrated way. But that's proved to be too costly, too slow, or as the data mesh people say, too monolithic. So in the 2010s, we moved to big data and introduced data lakes uh, and now data lake houses. And that's been good. A lot more data, a lot more volume, but a little bit ungoverned. So a lot of our lakes became data swamps. So now we're in the 2020s and data mesh and data fabric are on the ascendance, right? And the big change here is that the first three eras of data architecture are all IT driven and centralized for the most part. Whereas data mesh and data fabric are business driven and decentralized. Uh, so very, very different approach. But we do have to ask, <laughs> because every architecture has its downsides and limitations, what's going to be the downside or limitation here? Now, I have my thoughts, some of which were preconceived and probably overly biased, but let's talk about them. First, what is the market activity around these things? So this was a chart from the CDAO survey done annually by New Vantage Partners. And as you can see here, the data mesh and data fabric are 
not really doing well compared to other data analytics investments. Um, from a number one investment priority, it's only got 7.3% of CDAO saying that's that's their top priority, but 41% uh, saying they're investing in it, right? Uh, but what is interesting here is look at data products. They're way up there, they're number two. Uh, and this is interesting. When we first conceived of this tech vent, it was just data mesh and data fabrics. But then we realized that there's a trend afoot and people are very interested in data products because that is the primary output of a data mesh and a data fabric. So now let's separate data mesh and data fabric. Uh, Gartner thinks is very bullish on data fabric, thinks 80% of CDOs will have adopted a data fabric by 2025. And then data mesh, I couldn't find what Gartner thought about data mesh, but we did our own little LinkedIn poll earlier this year. And a lot of people are still on the sidelines trying to learn about it, trying to see what others are doing with it. And we'll find out very shortly <laughs> what one company is doing with it. 13% can't wait to implement. Uh, Paul, you fall into that group. And then 13% say it's a disaster in the making. And I must admit, I fell into that group initially. Uh, but I do think there's a lot of potential to data mesh uh, if it's done right. So architectural options. So when you boil it down, Okay, a data fabric is a distributed data architecture. It provides a single view across all your data. So the big benefit is you never have to move your data. However, in most cases, a data fabric is going to supplement, not replace a data warehouse, a data lake house. You, it's really hard to run your entire organization on a data fabric just because performance is not going to be there. You don't want to do complex joins across multiple data sets residing in different locations and systems. But what it's really great for is that it can inject agility into a centralized data architecture. And I think that's why Gartner is probably bullish about it and why I'm bullish about the data fabric. The data mesh, on the other hand, is something completely different. It's, it's a distributed business and development architecture. Basically, it's saying we're, we're going to revolt against the centralized IT centralized development approach, and we're going to push all development into the business and let them build their own uh, data products, which is great. And that's kind of been the trend for the last 15, 20 years, to be honest with you. But the data mesh goes further, and this is where I tend to have problems, that you know, if you're a purist data mesh, they want to eliminate all data warehouse, data lakes, and data lake houses. Uh, the goal is really to atomize monolithic data architectures and have everything be pushed out to the edge. And this came from the software engineering field um, and they wanna turn data into object oriented code. So that's kind of where it's coming from. Whether that will work entirely um, remains to be seen. So my problem with the data mesh is that, you know, it's kind of giving this message that data silos are now cool. We've been trying to beat down data silos for years, decades. Uh, and I think the message now is if you can't beat them, join them. And, you know, I have to say, uh, not so fast here. Uh, that's not to say there's a lot of value here, as I've said already. When you put data mesh and data fabric together, they provide really key components of self-service. Elements of self-service that we really haven't thought of, or at least most people haven't thought of yet, which is you need to have the right organization, the right governance, and the right architecture to do it. Because for years and years and years, data leaders and business leaders thought, oh, we want self-service. Let's just give people self-service BI tools and all will be well. Well, that is the wrong thing. It never works, right? Never has worked. So the problem, though, with data mesh and data fabric is that it is not the whole answer to self-service, right? I think, and I'd be curious what Paul and our panel thinks, is that you need to have a very strong enterprise data program and platform to make the mesh and the fabric work and self-service work. So in our consulting business, we say you can't just go out and build self-service, right? Self-service is the culmination of doing a hell of a lot of other things right. It's having the right operating model, the right data architecture, the right data governance, the right data, the right product development, and the right data literacy. When you get all those things right, then you give people the self-service BI tools and you'll be successful, right? It's the end result. 
but you can't do it with a completely distributed environment, organizational or architectural. So what does this look like? What is right? I think the right model is federated. In other words, you need both distributed and centralized elements for any of this stuff to succeed. Now, what does that look like? So I think, and the purists in the data mesh probably don't agree, is that the paradox of the data mesh is that you need a lot of central components, right? You need a shared data platform that all the domains are going to use. If you let them each create their own self-service data platform, you're in for a, a, a whole bunch of pain. Secondly, you need data standards that someone's got to set centrally and then propagate to each of the domains so that they use this shared data platform in the same way to uh, make sure you have both efficiency and effectiveness and everyone's aligned. The last thing you want is every domain creating their own data products that no one can use because they don't because they conflict. Well, that means you've got data silos, right? You also need that central data store or marketplace where everybody can publish their products so people can find them easily, frictionless way. Uh, and finally, you need enterprise governance where everyone from each of the domains gets together on a regular basis to set policy standards and processes. Okay, those things to me are all centralized. Someone centrally has to coordinate all of them and deliver all of them. So to me, success is federated. You need robust domains, building data products, using centralized standards, products, and platforms. So how do you keep a data mesh from becoming data mush? <laughs> well, you've got to centralize where it counts, as we just said. And something we haven't talked about as much right now is that your data asset creators need to adopt a product mindset. And I know this is the most challenging part for a lot of groups where you're doing things on a continuous basis and it's not you're moving from a project to a program mentality. So with that, let's bring in Paul to give us some real world perspective on all these things. So Paul, uh, and his team at Roach have done some amazing things with data mesh. They decided in 2021 to adopt a data mesh to get rid of a traditional monolithic data warehouse. Uh, in 2022, they onboarded 40 domain teams that built 50 data products supporting 1,300 users who can access 100 terabytes of data. Wow, that's impressive, right? And they've only continued that momentum this year. They've already onboarded 28 new product teams and added 300 plus products. Wow. Okay, they've got a great self-service centralized data platform, uh, but they do have some challenges. So, <laughs> Paul, welcome to our event here, and we are so glad to have you all the way from Switzerland. Thank you, Wayne. I'm kind of really happy to be here. We've uh, talked on many occasions over the, the past couple of years, and, you know, at first I did not like you because I knew you were a very a doubter, yeah. I was like, what's this guy talking about, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and then we started talking and, the, you know, really, I think it's it's good to talk to doubters at the start because, you know, you kind of get a different perspective. And especially when nobody really has implemented it, you know, when we first talked a couple of years ago, you know, nobody really had implemented data mesh at scale. And this was the, I mean, think that this is the problem, actually, you know, when people even now, there is no real handbook that says this is how you implement data mesh. And I think this is, you know, it is a concept. It, um, it was essentially, a, this is how we think it should be done. And what's ha what happens is, and you'll find this in many of your companies, is, is people interpret it the way they want to interpret it. Yeah, and they, they, they build the solutions the way that they think it should be built and not the way that it maybe, you know, works essentially in a pure data right. mesh uh, way. Right. So, but, you know, we're learning, we're all learning and it, we don't expect to get it right first time because there is no blueprint that says this is how you do it. And it's different for every company. And, you know, it works differently from a, for a big international, you know, global company as it does differently for a smaller type of, of medium-sized company, you know, and it really is depends a lot on your culture that exists in the company at the moment that, that you start, the, your maturity in terms of data culture, 
you know, how do people think about data? And it really is now, like, you know, at the start, I'm thinking, well, yeah, you know, social technical, as uh, Jamak describes, but I'm now thinking 90% social and 10% technical. <laughs> yeah, we we really have sorry the technical, but <laughs> all our problems are now on still on the social side. Well, we've got uh, we could talk for hours and hours, but we only have like 10 minutes or less. Uh, so maybe we could boil this down for our audience here. And talk about the keys to success and the key challenges that you face. So of all the things that you've done, you know, what what would be the keys to making this work? You've obviously been extremely successful and empowered these lots of business domains and product teams, uh, you know, 70 almost. Um, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Who, who are these teams <laughs> and where, and you know, how, how's this all working? So, you, you know, you you got to remember Roche is, is a huge company, yeah, but a very distributed company by nature, a very decentralized company when it comes to data and analytics. And, you know, in fact, central IT, uh, probably before we started two years ago, really only supported probably about 20% of the whole company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, you have these, you know, we have a lot of research and development, early research and early development companies in Roche. You know, they're like, well, IT doesn't understand our business. So we have our, you know, we have our own IT department. And then, you know, you Roche buys a company every year. They have their own IT department and, and they, you know, and essentially central IT only serve 20% of, of that. So when you think about that, you know, it is probably quite different to many other you know yeah. companies and and you have to make your analytics work on that and and that's why centralization is really was not working for us because we could only really centralize 20 percent of the company yep so what's the point yeah let's find a methodology and a, a way in a framework that really works to offer this domain driven company driven ownership and that is the key. And and you're right what you said. In fact, what you said is you didn't think the purists would agree on a, a central data platform. But, you know, we spoke, I've spoken personally to Jamak uh, many times about this. And she does agree that a central data platform with built-in, um, you know, automation, built-in policy control, built-in, you know, as much as you can build into a, to, to, to a service, a self-service platform, then, then that is the key because people don't want to worry about thinking about platforms for every single domain or, or, or in Roche's case, you had a platform for every use case nearly, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you want people to come along and just use it as a service, self-service, and they love it. And that's what, that was the key, really, is, is, is offering this capability to the business to want to use it, yeah? We're not... You know, IT have tried to force business to use their platforms for years. And, you know, this doesn't happen anymore. You know, business do not need IT to be successful. Yeah. But if they want to use you and they see the value, then of course they will. And that comes with it, you know, a lot of understanding, a lot of work to make a platform as self service as you can. Ultimately, you want your, your data platform to work like your iPhone. Yeah, you jump on, you can do something, yeah, pretty intuitively yeah. without too much effort at all. Yeah, and that's what we're striving for. Um, clearly, we're a long way off an iPhone, <laughs> but you know, I mean, that is the goal. We do not want a support function for the platform, we do not want a ticketing system. Yeah, we want these domains to be able to serve their selves and create their own support platform for their own products. Yeah, as you rightly said. So that, that certainly is a big factor in it, but that's the technical factor only, you know, the, the social factor comes with ownership and domain ownership. And you need to find the right people within the business that believe in this as much as you do from a from a tech perspective. And these people are, you know, they're quite difficult to find, but once you get one or two, you know, people to to partner with you and, and have the buy-in, 
and then other people look at them and find and look at the success that they're having and how quickly they can produce data products and how quickly they can generate savings, you know, and then they want, they want to play. Yeah, they want to come on board. So that's how you get the ball rolling. Get some really key business leaders that want to jump on, work with them, promote the hell out of the success, yeah, and other business leaders will come. Yeah. So this is a great cultural fit for Roach, for one, right? Mm -hmm. And then you got at it and ahead of it by building this self-service data platform. And so I assume you would agree with at least partly what I said in the keynote, which was that you've got to centralize the data mesh, uh, at least the self-service data platform to be successful. Yeah. So, you know, at this point, you've had a lot of success. What are the key challenges you're facing now? I've got some right here listed, data governance, data provisioning, product mindset. I, I'm curious what you think of the provisioning side of things. We could talk all day about uh, challenges in, in governance. You know, yeah. I mean, that is, <laughs> that's a, you should do a whole session on, uh, you, you know, federated governance, and, and I'll, I'll be happy to come in and talk to you about that. But so, you know, yes, governance comes at a lot of um, challenges. Really finding the right the right governance balance, I think, is the key. Federating, you know, governance comes with a bit of federating trust as well. And, you know, I think you need to find that within your company, how far you federate that. And, and we've had those challenges over the last couple of years, you know, and now we're we're seeing, yes, we've got lots of data products, but if you don't have the right mix of governance, then the data quality starts to drop because, you know, a lot of teams are not used to, to you know, defining their own policies and, and building them within the design stage. You know, they're used to kind of the afterthought, oh, someone needs access to my data, shit, I'm going to create a new role and then give them access. And, and then you end up with, you know, 100 people with a thousand different roles for one data product. So, you know, it's this, these challenges that do come because the skill set and the mindset is not as mature, you know, in the company, in some areas. You have some areas we have that, that maturity built up, but other areas not. And, you know, we were talking to a team the other day, you know, published 250 data products or whatever in commercial domain. And, you know, people are starting to use them and then they're surprised that people are using them and then complaining because they've got duplicates in their data because, you know, their data is not as what the source is telling them and, and this and that, you know, and that you talked about the difference between a data asset and a, a data product. For me, it's the product thinking, the mindset of, you know, a team that is building a product that you, they, they're putting out there, as you said, very transparent we're putting it out there for people to reuse and people to trust and that whole mindset is the difference for me is the product thinking mindset you know that is really the key if you don't have that within the domain teams within the data product teams you know we're back to square one i think yeah. people lose trust on the data products so what do they do they don't use their data products they just create a silo by bringing in their own data products yeah 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 and the beat goes on so what about data provisioning do you have a central data store or not how do people yeah. find these products these yeah companies? we build our own like you said <laughs> there wasn't a lot of choice on the market for internal data stores, and and some of the companies are trying to move into that space but you know, without naming any of them, it's a poor effort, if you ask me. Yep, um, it's just kind of a bolt-on um, effort, and not really thinking about the internal user and what it what it means. Yeah, uh, you know, there is there is definitely, as you said, space for uh, in the market for a really good internal marketplace. Um, we uh, we build our own. Um, decided to go that route, although we're reviewing that right now, because what you end up clearly is with a team of 50 developers maintaining an internal marketplace, you know, and you still have that whole backlog issue, you yeah. know, it's quite slow for changes and, and this and that. So we're really looking for a vendor now to help us uh, accelerate this option because, you know, we're moving past the need just for keyword content searches. You know, we, we really want really efficient search capabilities even within the product itself. So not only searching on keywords and descriptions, but searching on on data. Yeah. 
what is you know i've got this material number what other products can i use you know that might enhance our product that has the same material number for example and this is where we we're really moving to now so talk to me in six months next year we may have a, a different solution you know? oh great so paul are you gonna be able to stick around in case people have questions yeah, yeah sure um, i'll be here for the rest of the, the conference Oh, terrific. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much. I know that you were just got, I would just touched on the tip of the iceberg here and there was so much more uh, beneath yes. the surface that we could talk about, um, but they'll have to wait for another time. So thank you. No problem. Thank you. All right. So just a few more things before we move to the panel discussion. As I said earlier, we usually do a quadrant chart and we put products in each quadrant and talk about what that means to help you create a short list. But with data mesh and data fabric, you kind of need everything, right? It's a little bit easier with a data fabric because uh, if you think of a, if you define a data fabric as uh, data virtualization and federated, federated queries, then we actually have uh, two of the leading data fabric companies here today. So uh, rather than give you a short list, I'm just gonna talk about our sponsors today um, and read you a description that I wrote, they didn't write. I think they reviewed it, but didn't get any feedback, so I assume they liked it. So uh, Prometheum is a full stack data fabric that connects to, to data wherever it resides, making it easy for power users and others to discover and evaluate data, join and transform it, visualize and share it, this self-service data fabric injects agility into a monolithic environment, unlocking the potential data and the users who want it. Yeah, uh, something every company needs. Uh, Cogenity provides a collaborative platform for SQL-based power users that fosters reuse and sharing and improves data analyst productivity. Cogenity helps power users find data, create pipelines, analyze and visualize the data and share their results in an intuitive manner that aligns with their natural work processes. And finally, Starburst is a data fabric that offers high performance distributed queries uh, built for the cloud that provides analytics on data in your data lake or anywhere in or beyond your organization. Uh, with Starburst, you never have to move your data to analyze, govern, or share it. It's always within reach. So really good products here today and i i encourage you to check them out on the resource page uh, attend their breakout sessions listen to them on the panel that's coming up in the, a few minutes and uh, also attend their topic tables to get more information so we're very lucky to have these three with us today uh, i just mentioned that and then just as a quick recap before we regroup for the panel discussion from my keynote anyway, uh, a data product has the characteristics of something that can be bought or sold to people you do not know. You need a data store if you're going to produce data products or data marketplace. The key to producing data products is to have a product mindset and ample governance, as Paul said. A data fabric injects agility into a monolithic data environment, so we should all get one. That's something Gartner and uh, I definitely agree on. <laughs> Uh, and a data mesh, paradoxically, requires centralization to succeed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to talk about our next session that will resume after a quick break. All right. Now it's time for the most energetic part of our event, where we have three experts that are going to discuss how to evaluate and select data mesh and data fabric products. I will introduce you to the panelists and hand over to Wayne to moderate. Rick Hall has spent nearly three decades in the analytics industry, including designing and implementing over 100 systems and analytics products. Casey Lai has led global operations and product management for both startups and Fortune 500 companies, including most recently Waterline Data. Casey, did I pronounce your last name right? You did, thank you. Okay, thank you. And you're a frequent guest, so I, I'm glad I got it right. <laughs> Uh, Matt Fuller has worked in the uh, data analytics and infrastructure space for the past 15 plus years at Carver's uh, companies such as Starburst, Teradata, Adapt, HP, and Vertica. So we highly recommend you to submit questions during the panel. We've also got a lot that came in during the keynote. I'm going to work to address those into the uh, discussion today. Okay, Wayne, over to you. Yeah, I should just say to further the introductions that Rick 
raise your hand. You're from Cogenity, CEO. Casey, CEO of Prometheum. And Matt, you're the co-founder and CTO of Starburst, right? Co-founder and VP product. VP of product, close, okay, awesome. All right, so let's dive right in here. So Matt, I'm gonna start with you. Why is everyone talking about data products today? Um, you saw that from the chart in my keynote. What do you think a data product is in the primary characteristics? Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll address the first part, why people are, are talking about it. I think, you know, if we look over the last several years, just kind of the number of data sources and data repositories have just grown dramatically as the number of applications grew, data producers grew, the, the array of uh, customers and use cases, everything's just expanding and getting a lot more complicated, not less. And then so, you know, naturally you want to run analytics on this data. So you're creating, you know, use these brittle pipelines, complex pipelines, things are just getting messier. So just putting everything kind of in, in one place is is not not practical. It's it's fool's gold, I guess. And so this is where like data mesh, you know, comes to the rescue. And and at the heart of data mesh is data products. And you know, this is just like kind of the new way of thinking about things. Is there's the technology, but there's the people and process aspects as well. But data products really allow you to apply kind of best practices for managing and, and consuming the data, really just treating it like a product, like, like anything else and packaged in a way that allows you to um, easily discover it, understand it, consume it, and then, and actually ultimately trust the product itself. So those are kind of the, you know, the why I believe everyone's um, talking about data products and, and what I believe the data product is. Yeah. It seems that of all the things that the mesh has put out in the marketplace, people have glommed on to the data product aspect of it the most. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why I was mentioning that, like, you know, we talk about data mesh, but data product is really that that heart of it that just kind of makes this all um, you know, tie together. Yeah, I like the way you, I think you phrased it, 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 the data product help you implement the best practices for building these things, yeah. Exactly. All right, so Rick, let, let's go to you. What are the major, major challenges that your clients are facing building data products today? And what kind of tools and capabilities can uh, facilitate the development and delivery of data products? Yeah, so we provide a collaborative workspace for engineers and analysts to build and access data. And they range in all kinds of customers, from really big customers with thousands of users who have the kind of distributed problem that, that Roche has mentioned to small companies. Uh, and they really range in terms of their adoption of these modern data practices and things like data mesh and data fabric. But what they all have in common is challenges in delivering quality data and analytics when business is changing all the time. So I really put the challenges that they're wrestling with in three categories. One is ownership. And I think that's the biggest issue associated with data products is creating ownership so we create quality data. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second is how to really you trace data and deal with quality throughout its journey. And then finally, I would put empowerment of the business team. So it's one thing to think about data. We ultimately have to think about analytics and how that data is being used. And we need to think about empowerment there as well. So I think there's both organizational and technical challenges here uh, on the organizational side, you know, complete agreement. We need data product ownership and we need data product owners because we have quality data problems. I also think it's really critical to think about how we're going to create empowerment and climate. What that means technically, I think, is that people need access to data wherever it lives. It's not all in one place. That's, you know, just the reality that particularly large organizations face, but I think it's true for small as well. And I think we need tooling to build and govern, you know, our data assets, data products. And that means, you know, great data workspaces. It means traceability, lineage and metadata. It means the ability to build in testing. Uh, it means collaboration and it means versioning and the ability to promote uh, things to, uh, to standards. And we need a means of discovering and accessing and utilizing that data, which means appropriate security. It means discoverability. Uh, see if they utilize the data in the way they need to and pose it with other data assets. 
Great. It's all wonderful stuff. Thank you. Casey, I talked a lot about data stores, data marketplaces. Where do you think is the best way for people to find data products? In a catalog, given your history at Waterline, <laughs> data store, what do you think? What's your opinion on this subject? Yeah, so I think it, the short answer is it depends, right, in terms of kind of who the persona is and also kind of what you're looking for, right? So I think catalogs uh, can be helpful if you're a, you know, rather sophisticated user and, you know, with enough hints, you can figure out where else to go. Because the, the challenge um, that I think what's happened in recent years, last few years, that's kind of made it tough, difficult for catalogs to be that single place to find everything is that, you know, catalogs used to be the only place where you got all the metadata, right? And so that was the best place to find things because you have all this descriptive metadata. But actually what's kind of cool and what's interesting in the last few years that's happened is you have so many other tools now that generate metadata. That's useful metadata. I mean, BI tools generate them, ETL tools, observability tools generate them and so forth. And so what we find is that to have like good data consumption and govern data consumption, it's hard for the catalog to keep up because a lot of the metadata now actually resides outside of the data catalog, right? But if you're like a, a pretty sophisticated power user and you're only working within like a certain uh, subset of the data, like you, you'll never go beyond one data store, like say Snowflake and one beyond, you know, one or two schemas. Catalog's probably pretty okay right, for you to kind of find where you are, okay, it's limited. But if we're talking about kind of these concepts you're bringing up about kind of, you know, federated access and you want to be able to find and build products regardless of where they live, I think that's where catalogs get a little bit challenging, right, because of what I just talked about, the, the metadata not always being there. And also, when you're doing that type of exploration work, there's an element where you need to see the data, where you need to see, well, th does this look right? And that's where catalogs are challenging because they don't have the data access. And so that kind of shifts that out of the catalogs and into something more, maybe like a data marketplace. But a data marketplace, I have to keep in mind, is in order for that to be effective, you really need the marketplace to only have uh, trusted, curated, and endorsed data. So that way it doesn't screw up who's consuming. And typically, the people who would go to a marketplace are not going to be at you know, the sophisticated power users. So you really want to put guardrails, if you will, so that way people don't get in trouble. And to do that, right, that means it's also different different type of data discovery. That means the data products or the uh, output and consumables have gone through some rigor, right, in terms of really making sure that they work, that they're trusted, and you, know, you can actually, you know, verify where everything is. Yeah, that's an interesting point that access. not every data asset in a catalog is going to be certified, right? We have stewards who govern the catalog who go and decide which of those assets are, get that stamp of approval. But in a data store, and I was kind of making this case, every one of those assets needs to be certified. I mean, that's what a product is. It is standardized and certified that's going to deliver as promised. So... Uh, but Matt, let me go back to you. You know, I talked a lot about bridging organizational boundaries. What do you think is the best way to foster the free flow of data across those boundaries and get people to collaborate around data? Yeah. So yeah, I think just kind of going back to you know what are what are some best you know practices and, and kind of choosing those that that work for you. So I think you can kind of follow the processes and, and practices of of what's outlined in data mesh, but, you know, there are also kind of tools and products out there that could kind of help uh, assist with this, you know, Starburst could be, you know, one of those, um, but really looking for a, a product that can, um, you know, help you search and discover and trust the data. So, um, you know, things like, you know, data products that you can search, but also apply and govern access control or permissions on, so you don't have to create a, a mess of, um, you know, varying data products that have, you know, slightly different, you know, permissions on them, making it very difficult to find and ultimately people just aren't going to trust. And it's going to be very hard to, to share those, you know, providing kind of rich metadata on top of these data products so that you, you know, it's the thing that you're looking for. And you were, you were kind of mentioning earlier, like, how do you certify these things? If there were 
tools or, or products, um, you know, that could monitor the usage of these, right? And and the ones that are just most used and loved and trusted, it's kind of like has this like social aspect to it where, you know, those ones kind of implicitly become certified. And then you can, you know, based on usage, monitor ones and, and sunset those to kind of avoid that swamp. So those are some of the characteristics I think would help help with that. Um, and then ultimately, like, you just want that Amazon-like experience of the same way you buy a product on Amazon.com, like, searching that with, with data products. You know, you could, you could build all of this internally, or um, even that could be a lot of engineering work. So there are tools and products out there, you know, that could help. So that's kind of how I think about it. Okay, great. There's a lawnmower outside my window. I don't know if you guys can hear that. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't coordinate with the gardener, Wayne, when you're doing this webinar. Uh, yeah, they always catch me by surprise. So I want to ask Rick a question, then Kevin, maybe you can inject a question from the audience here. Um, so Rick, I talked about data mesh and data fabric, and I made a case that they're different, but symbiotic. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Do you have a strict definition yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually do agree with that. You know, they both came about to address kind of the same problem, right? Which is data is everywhere. The centralized approach to data isn't working. You know, data fabric came about it as a technical solution, right? An architecture. Data mesh came about is this kind of socio-technical mix of both. The most important thing to me about mesh is the data product, right? And data ownership, right? And, you know, Matt said that, and I agree with him 100%. Um, I think ultimately we need to merge these languages together because I think that a lot of people are confused. And, you know, you go back to your survey about what are people working on, you know, what they're working on is modernizing their ability to access data, right? So they need data. They need to access distributed data. They need to know that the data is of high quality, and then they need to be able to use it and combine it in different ways. So. Ultimately, to me, I think there's a couple of principles, right? Data is a product. I think everybody agrees we need access to quality data. And, you know, a lot of organizations don't have it. I also think we need to address empowerment. We need people at the edge to be able to use that data. And we need to foster collaboration. Uh, and then we need this governance thing, which we think of as curation, where the best data becomes available and becomes published and standardized. And, uh, so I think the two really need to be merged. I think there's great ideas in both cases, but I think for us to really revolutionize the business, we uh, need to adopt a common language. That, that makes sense, seems fair to me. Kevin, any questions from the audience? I know you got a lot, but- the Yeah, that's some great commentary that I think is really gonna feed into uh, the takeaways, Wayne. I think we've got 40 comments that I've captured here. Probably people see me taping. One of the questions that came up both during this session and then during the keynote was for specific examples of data products. We got some great uh, color commentary from Roche, but perhaps the panelists could talk about vertical specific examples of data products and the level of detail that was required to really make it a product. So I'll, I'll treat that openly. If uh, you want us to point at folks, we can do that too. So, so for me, I would just say, first of all, in every domain, there's a granular set of data products, right? So the thing that I think has happened with analytics is a lot of times we don't know the usage of data up front, right? So one of the big problems we've had is that we tried to create these data warehouses where we built in analytics and we built BI solutions that address specific needs. So I think data products need to be granular. Uh, you know, we see that in every industry we're working in. They need to be discoverable, they need to be readable. Those are really kind of critical components. So, you know, it might be store sales in a retail environment. That's certainly one we see. But the key thing for us is separating the development of kind of granular data products from this collaboration around the use of that data because we don't know how it's going to be used up front. Yeah, I've heard a lot of vendors particularly talking about data components or analytic components that are building blocks for bigger things, right? And if you can give people, especially business people, access to these building blocks, point and click, you know, no code environment, they, they can build their own data products. 
not sure if that's what you're talking about, but it's along the same lines. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think we need components and we need to be able to assemble them, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, people at the edge need to be able to do that. And, yeah. uh, you know, we need central data teams or, net or distributed data teams to create quality data. Uh, and then we need to get people using that data and building on it in ways that we don't know about up front. I think one of the, um, if, I, if I think about kind of how customers are consuming different data products and the products that are successful uh, that versus the products that are not successful, um, one thing that jumps out in mind is products that are successful have a big characteristic of integration and uh, can't find a better word. And I don't mean like data integration. Uh, what I mean is that you can see how it all ties together. Like right? we're, we're very good at, the industry is very good at creating disjointed outputs, right? Here's the data set. Have no, you have no idea where it came from. You have no idea what, 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 what your data set. Uh, here's a query, same thing. Here's a dashboard, same thing, right? And it, 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 only a few people can kind of figure out kind of how they're actually related. And so where I've seen kind of successful data products is if you can actually see how it's actually all built, right? Well, this dashboard was built because someone asked this question. These are, this is what they can access. This is this, the data that went into it. This is how the data set that was used. This is where it came from. This is who governed it. And when you can see kind of all these, what used to be completely separate components come together to form that output, then you instantly get better trust, right? Because you don't have to go scour and search across six or different tools across 30 different people in the organization, it's there unified, presented nicely for you. And so, you know, it is part of that component concept, but it's making the components visible to kind of the final output, right? Which I think is really important as opposed to, we tend to just focus on the output, right? Oh, I got, I got my you know, store sales, I I'm done. Well, it's no, I mean, you got store sales because this is what went into store sales. Take a look at it, verify it. And by the way, 5,000 people have liked it in the last three months and it's been used 30 times. And here's store sales has also been used to calculate store churn. So you have all this relevant contact fully integrated together, right? And again, maybe integrate is not the best word, but I think that is actually a very important concept when people think about data products, because ultimately that's going to give people much better trust, comfort, than saying, let's make a data steward go in. Only that data steward can, rat can ratify that. I think that's one of the failures of kind of uh, being able to govern and endorse data is it's not just up to one person's rubber stamp, right? You have to have that visibility and clarity of how all these pieces are actually put together. We had one oh. comment, uh, Casey, uh, person said, uh, what you call data integration is really data product coherence. So they wanted to give that. That's a good term. That's a good term. If you, uh, yeah. you're looking for a job in marketing, let me know. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with, with Casey about, you know, just seeing that lineage of how the data product was, was created. It's just so important. So you can trust it. Um, the only additional thing I would say where I've seen data products work really great is, and it's related to that, is like being able to combine data from different sources like i think a lot of times like the great data products you're like just like you're like just a join away you just you just need to be able to join in that additional data whether you know you have usage data on on the lake and you need to be able to join it with the the customer billing info that happens to exist in our operational store somewhere you know each of those independently may not be great data products but the combination of it is like you know the the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts type type thing yeah, I, I agree with you, Matt. I think a lot of times, you know, we forget about this old term master data, right? But, you know, we need a way to link the cu customer in our payment system with the customer in our billing system or what, whatever it is. And uh, whether that's another domain, that perhaps is a way to think of it is that we need those domains uh, also so that we can link this data effectively. And I totally agree with the lineage uh, thing. I would also say that the downstream use, right, is going to evolve really quickly. So, you know, you need to let analysts and users build stuff and then kind of promote it. I think that analytics is becoming more uh, of an organic discipline than it is an engineered discipline and the best work will be promoted uh, to be reused. 
All right. So I want to ask Casey a question, actually all of us, but uh, to start with Casey on generative AI, we can't to go uh, do an event like this and not talk about the hottest technology out there. How is the data fabric going to help the implementation and adoption of generative AI? Yeah, good question. So I think we all, yeah, if you, unless you've been living under a rock, right, you probably all have generated everyone's product site around different LLMs like ChatGPT, uh, et cetera. And I think what we love about it is the simplicity, right, um, and the speed, right? And I think those are actually two very important components of data product that I, I, I think people kind of gloss over. Like when I give a very, very simple definition of data product, I usually involve it has to be fast and easy to consume. Because if it's not fast and easy to consume, I think you've missed it, right? Then you're going back uh, 10, 20 years. And I think generative AI has pushed that, uh, really pushed the boundaries of that. The challenge though, generative AI, as some of you guys may have already figured out is, well, I got two challenges. One is how do I just give it all my data, right? Uh, you probably don't want to do that from a security perspective, one, but two, it kind of reminds me of the days of machine learning where everyone's like, I just give it all your data and we'll train a machine learning model. And 18 months later, everyone's like, what the heck has happened? We have no idea what these data scientists are doing. Uh, I am really scared of that we may be repeating history all over again, right? With uh, Journey of AI. But so what you really need is a different kind of architecture, right? What Gen AI is really good at doing is if you give it trusted, endorsed, curated information, it's really good at figuring out kind of the natural language and how to use that to give you the answers. The problem, if you look at all our enterprise data stack is, well, what if you have a different ETL tool, a different virtualization tool, a different catalog, 25 different data stores? How is Gen AI going to make sense of that in the next 36 months in your organization, right? And that's probably how long it's going to take. And so if you think about it, a data fabric is actually really ideal for Gen AI because it actually provides almost like a single, for lack of a better term, like API access, right? Virtually, right? Because the fabric already connects to all your data sources. The Gen AI doesn't need to talk to all their data sources. It just needs to talk to the fabric. What other components does the fabric has? Well, it has the governance aspect. So it doesn't need to give Gen AI everything. It can just give the trusted endorsed information, right? And if you have techniques like data virtualization, well, that's even better because you actually never technically have to give data to Gen AI, right? So this is where it becomes really interesting of where data fabric can play is you can greatly accelerate the adoption of Gen AI by greatly enhancing the relevance of the data by only limiting it to trust and endorse data, not having to physically move the data, right? Using data virtualization techniques and the fabric itself being that single unifying infrastructure layer now means you actually have the ability to leverage an AI across all the different sources of data you have. So you know, that's how where we see kind of the fabric being really the, the, the nice missing component where enterprises can say, let's go ahead and accelerate our Gen AI adoption without having to worry about hallucinations and security and complexity. I, agree with that. I think that without data products, generate AI, AI is going to be just trouble. Quality data under the hood uh, and then gen AI on top is really useful. I also think you need to be able to ingest domain knowledge, right? And domain definitions, right? So, you know, it may be that, you know, a gen AI model can calculate gross margin because it's just seen it a million times. But you might have a definition for store sales or lost opportunity or you know whatever. Uh, you want the model to be able to ingest that domain intelligence along with quality data, and then you really have something powerful. I would say two things on generative AI is um, in addition to you know data products, I think you know it can it could help with certain data engineering tasks as well, whether it's classifying data, um, you know, tagging it, you know, providing, um, you know, governance around it and so on. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, looking at these data products and, and helping provide those insights, you know, to, to kind of, um, highlight those as well as I think something generative. So Matt, I had a, another question for you uh, and Kevin, maybe you could key, key up another 
uh, audience question in a second. Yeah, I, I got a good one, but go ahead. Got a good one, okay. I talked a little bit about the dangers of a data mesh being data silos, you know, and that there's, there might be a rush to, now we have a methodology that endorses us to go out and do our own thing, regardless of what anyone else is doing, produce data products that really are for us. And if anyone wants to use them, fine, but we didn't design them for you. <laughs> So how do you keep a data mesh or even a data fabric from becoming mush, you know, and creating all these silos? Or maybe that's the answer. Maybe the data fabric is the answer, you know, to the data mush. I mean, I think it's where data products, you know, comes in and making sure that you're monitoring them to make sure you're not creating that data swamp, like just maintaining these highly curated data product assets to, to kind of prevent that mush or, or swamp. In many ways, I like to think about data products or, you know, depending on the technology you're using, but in, in the case of Starburst, you know, using uh, Trino behind the, the scenes, we can create data products across a variety of different data sources. So it, it gives that illusion that the data is centralized in a single place without actually having to move it. So it kind of gives you that like best of both worlds. Approach. Would you call those virtual data products? You could, yeah. I haven't thought of that, that term in general, but yeah, you could uh, consider it that way, you know, or they could be materialized within a, a data store using, you know, a technology um, to do that. So even though it is, you know, you're creating data product, it almost creates a pipeline, you know, automatically for you, kind of like a um, declarative pipeline by a data product to, to land it somewhere or, yeah, virtualize it, as you mentioned. Yeah, I like the notion of a virtual data product because it, it, you know, in some ways it can be redefined on demand by the customer, right? Yeah, or even if you decide to move the data from, you know, source system A to source system B, you can do that behind the scenes and the consumers of the data products never even have to know. No, no. Yeah, and I think one problem with data products is that when you define them and publish them, they're kind of fixed. And you, you, we really don't want that because it's it's hard. Even if you do the best market research, you really don't know what customers want and they don't know what they want until they actually see it. So if you have a virtual data product, you actually can give customers the ability to kind of filter that product to create just what they want, get just the data and records they want, or to even combine it with other data products to create a, a net new product that's really personalized to their needs. So to be honest, I didn't mention this in my keynote, but I do think virtual data products is the future. I agree. I think the thing that I've always been humbled uh, every single time is human behavior is always hard to change, right? So I've, I, while I think that is the future, I think the reality is to prevent data products from turning into data mush or becoming a silo in and of itself, is like it or not, you have to work with the existing processes and the, the existing flow, right? And so what I mean by that is a lot of times you can't assume that people are going to change your behavior overnight, for example, where the data is consumed, right? So as much as, you know, I also use Trino under the hood, right? Like, like servers, as much as I'm a big fan of Trino, the reality and is that sometimes people want to consume that somewhere else, right? And so you have to allow that. And that means it's not only a different data store, but it could be a different dashboard, a different BI tool, for example. And and a BI tool, uh, a dashboard could be a data product, right? To a certain persona, that is their data product. And so how do you maintain that visibility? Because I think that's what's going to be key in preventing the silos. It's, you can't lose connection of the data product just because it leads your product. The minute you do that, you get into the same trouble that data catalogs have gotten into, right, for a long time, which is when you get that disconnect. So if you can still remain connected, it's like, fine, I created a data product. You didn't want to consume it in me. I materialized it somewhere else in Snowflake and Tableau and Power BI. But I know when it's being consumed. I know when people like it, don't like it. Um, that, I believe, that universal and unified view right, of how the products are actually consumed is what's going to prevent, right, from a silo being created. And also it's going to give you much better governance when you start seeing that downstream consumption, regardless if it's actually being consumed in your product or not, right? And that thing, that fabric, you know, visual image of connectivity, I think that's where it's very, very powerful, right, to be able to have that continuous view and continuous uh, lineage of where things are being consumed. 
Yeah. So Kevin, back to you uh, to ask yeah. the audience question. And then we only have like uh, 10 minutes left. So I want to ask the whole panel uh, some rapid fire questions at the end. So we want to leave some time for that. Great. So rich commentary once again on this session. Thank you everyone for participating here. Uh, people like the mush concept, which is great. <laughs> they don't like the concept, they like the term. There were two questions, two commentaries or questions that came up related to the market evolution slide that you had moving from a lake in particular to a fabric or a mesh. And uh, there seems to be, uh, and I, I tend to agree that there are many vestiges or um, elements of a data lake that can contribute to what we're talking about here. So an open question to the panelists here would be, what's the role of the data lake architecture or possibly a lake house architecture when we talk about a fabric and a mesh? Uh, I think that's a question for Matt. <laughs> yeah. I Matt, mean, why don't we start with you? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean, I firmly believe that, you know, there's going to be a lot of data gravity um, in the lake today and in, in the future. So what I see and what we see a lot of our customers today is they, they absolutely have a data lake strategy where a lot of their data is born, but they often need to augment it with data that may exist in other sources. So, you know, just take usage information from an application like event machine data, that's just large amounts of data that's being born in the lake, but you need to combine it with um, and join it back to identifiable information that's in a, a relational store somewhere. So I think, you know, you're going to see that center of gravity with the lake, but being able to kind of, you know, spoke out into the different different sources is, is part of that strategy. Yeah, I, I think a lake or a warehouse, right? It, it fits in nicely with data fabric uh, strategy or data products. I don't think they should be competitive, right? Because I think there is a, um, for two reasons. One is there is a wealth of data and knowledge there. Um, and two is you always have to, when you talk data products, like a big core part of that is actually security, access control, uh, et cetera, right? So when you want to, in order to get data products to be consumable, they have to be operationalized. Well, a lot of that operationalizing actually happens. People build that into the lake. People build that into the warehouses, right? Things like fine grain access control, security, role-based access. You don't want to throw that away, right? There's a lot of good stuff uh, in there, right? And then the other part is also just when you have data of a certain scale, right? Laws of physics eventually can catch up to you. And as much as I love virtualization and everything, there's going to be times when we've seen just massive, massive queries and data sets that it's better handled if it's all processed in one place, right, um, for those needs. And so I don't see them as ever being competitive. They shouldn't be. I think you know, a, a, a mesh or a fabric and the data, fab, data product concept could greatly enhance uh, and accelerate, right, the adoption of a data warehouse or data lake or data lake so, house. These, these days I have to say all three now. So that, that's encouraging because you guys both agree then with what I said, which is a data fabric supplements, which you've got data warehouse, data lake, whereas a mesh in theory wants to torpedo <laughs> anything that's centralized, uh, which I don't, I don't think is going to work for most companies. And, and, but maybe Paul's going to prove us wrong. Uh, and the jury's still out there because I know he still has a warehouse. Um, all yeah. right, I want to ask all of you guys a rapid fire question. Uh, maybe two, since we're coming down to the end here. You heard my keynote. I was being a little provocative there. So I'd love to know one thing you either really agreed with or really disagreed with. I'll put you on the spot here. And if you don't say anything, I'll just assume that you agreed with everything I said. And, you know, I should be nominated to be the head of this industry. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. The, pro the problem is, if you ask my wife, I've got a, like a five minute memory, right? So, like, I, <laughs> you said a lot of great things that they might be controversial. I may have forgotten already. <laughs> well, that, that's that's <laughs> encouraging because I used to teach history and I remember, I couldn't remember what I taught the week before. So, uh, I always thought there was something wrong with me, but now you reassured me that's not true. <laughs> okay. Anybody I think the data any product thoughts? notion, right? The, the central to whether it's mesh or fabric, uh, you talked about it, we've all talked about it, uh, managing quality data in a way that's accessible is key. Okay. I think, so you gave a, as I said earlier, I think you gave a really good um, framework and guideline in terms of um, how to have like a successful data product, 
the whole check-in, check-out process. You know, it's a consistency aspect, kind of marketplace. Fantastic, very, very thorough. Just want to kind of throw in the kind of a more of a practitioner's view that is, I don't want to see customers getting bogged down for three years, trying to have all that in place before they deploy something, right? Because that's the mistake we've made in the last 10, 20 years. I think uh, you, agility uh, is actually very, very important. Again, I go back to what makes a data product kind of unique from data marts, right? That we've had for a while is that fast and easy consumption. Yes, you need a level of security and governance. Totally great, right? But if you don't ever get to that fast and easy consumption, you're never going to be able to justify building out the rest of the marketplace and that framework. Because if no one ever consumes something, this is what we've seen. We've already seen this many, many times with data warehouses and data lakes and catalogs, et cetera. If no one ever consumes, right, it actually impacts, right, the usability, viability, and even call to the question, right, you know, relevance yeah. and yeah. governance. So I, that's, I that's the only thing I would just add. No, I, yeah. like Gartner, I'm just a big believer in the fabric because on day one or day maybe week one, you can inject that agility into a moribund monolithic data environment. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, I got to give Paul credit because he had to build that self-service data platform first Props to yeah, that guy. before <laughs> before you could, you know, let these product teams loose, right? And that, I don't know how he did that. You know, he did it real quickly. <laughs> Yeah, so most companies can't move that fast. Matt, you were going to say something. Oh yeah, I was going. I was just going to kind of tack on to what Casey said. It's like, yeah, there's the technology, but the the people in process of can kind of slow down. You know, getting a mesh adopted, so you have to, you know, you know, be flexible there, and you know, being able to get something people can use right away, as you were mentioning, I, I think is the right approach, and um, you know, eventually things can be decentralized if you go in that direction, but that doesn't happen overnight. It's a, it's a journey. Yeah. Access data wherever it lives, right. And start to make it accessible in a quality way. And you kind of off to the races. Yeah. All right. So we got like, like three minutes left. So I want to ask you guys a, a rapid mm -hmm. fire question and you have to give short answers, <laughs> no more than 30 seconds. Okay. So the first rapid fire question is what do you see as the biggest change in our industry in the next 18 to 24 months? I think it's the shift away um, from IT push down, yeah, which, which has dominated the space for a long time, right? It, these tools are too complex and so everything has to be pushed down from the top. And I think as a society, <laughs> human beings have evolved. Company culture has also evolved where I don't think people want to do that. The business does not want to do that. And so we're seeing more of, no, it's better to have IT and, and the corporate get involved once you have seen how we're using it, right? right? And at that okay. point, when you have those data points, you can right. enforce it. Let me give you the hook here. Uh, <laughs> Matt, we got to be short here. I'll just say one sentence, because I, I think we're going to see more of a decentralized approach to the, the ownership of, of data. All right, we, you and Casey are in lockstep here. I'm going to agree with that, and I'm going to add oh in, my God. in collaboration at the edge, wow. uh, which is going to be really critical to success. Okay, uh, last question for you all. Uh, what is your product's biggest differentiator? Because we do, people are here to learn about products, not just data products, but you know, products they can buy and use internally. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's what this whole tech bent's about, is to give people a short list of products. What's your key differentiator in, in 30 seconds or less? Or actually maybe 15? I'm going to go with where it's a collaborative workspace, right? That engineers and analysts can work together, share and reuse, and work on the same stuff. Cool. Matt and Casey, guys. Well, I'll go. Yeah, I'll go. Yeah, so uh, Starburst and... Our biggest product differentiator is is to provide that single point of, of secured access for, for all your data. Um, but in addition to that access point, we do the processing for you at fast speed, large scale, and at a low cost from data lakes to databases to NoSQL systems to SaaS applications. We can, we can process and access it all. One point of access. Gotta love that. 
KC, you get the last word here. All right. Uh, I would say our, our biggest point of differentiation is we realize the fact that data analytics is a team sport. You have multiple personas. And so what Prometheum does is it actually allows multiple personas to work together uh, or separately uh, without having to go through multiple tools. And that means making things even as easy for non-technical folks. And I think we're very proud of the fact that we incorporated natural language, not just for search, but actually for the full creation of data products all the way from the query to the visualization just through natural language. I think that's still something that we, we do very, very well compared to other folks. Awesome, okay. All right, so I wanna thank uh, all our panelists here uh, for a great conversation and enlightening us about data products, data mesh and data fabric. And now, Kevin, you there? I know you're having some static on the line. Do you want me to take it from here? Okay. Uh, so now's your chance to attend breakout sessions uh, with our industry experts. Following the breakouts, we're going to have a topic tables, and we encourage you to visit where you can drill down even further on specific topics with our experts. This is a collaborative session. We talked a little bit about collaboration earlier. So Kevin and I are going to start out by talking about key takeaways that we heard. But we want to hear what your key takeaways are, and we'll just add them to this list here. We're just going to create multiple slides until we run out of time. <laughs> Kevin, does that sound good to you? Yeah, that sounds great. And I should say that some of the stuff I have aims to synthesize the pretty rich commentary we had from folks during the keynote and the panel discussion. A lot of folks chiming in with their perspectives. So we've tried to boil that down here, but as Wayne said, we'd love to have others contribute anyone contribute if you feel we're not uh, representing what you've got. All right. So I want to give the first key takeaway. <laughs> All right. You go first. All right. So, you know, everybody that research analysts like from Gartner, Forrester and Eckerson Group, uh, we get paid to create industry buzzwords. It's a mark of an analyst to say, ah, the industry adopted my buzzword. So, I don't know. Seems like we got a lot of resonance around the term data mush. Don't let your data mesh become a data mush. Um, so that's that's one thing that I heard from people. They like that term. What about you, Kevin? So I had a, a couple thoughts. I think the data product seems to be the primary way I'm looking at this. Data product is the primary catalyst for change. Yeah, And also for adoption of best practices when it comes to mesh and fabric implementations. Yeah, you know, Matt said something about data products is the way you implement best practices. And I thought that was pretty good. I mean, it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning about what's the difference between a data asset and a data product. I mean, don't we want all of our data assets to to be developed and delivered with best practices. Well, yes, we do, right? So maybe I was splitting hairs by saying, all right, everything we do should have governance and it should be have high quality and it should have service level service agreements. Level. And I'm just wow. thinking, okay, maybe there's something a little different about a data product. Uh, and maybe I'm still hung up on that. But, but yeah, I like that. It's adoption for best practices, yeah. Wayne, your turn. I got more, yeah. but I'll let you go. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I haven't queued all mine up here. You know, I was talking to Paul Rankin in our in our topic table, and, <laughs> and I had to ask him about if he agreed with me on the data store. And he goes, "Well, yeah, we have data stores, but we don't have just one. We have dozens of them. So each domain, I mean, they really have decentralized things. So each domain has its own place to publish data products." And they're building an Uber store that sits on top of all those other data stores or data catalogs. I'm not sure exactly how they're implementing it. Um, so that people can search across all the domain stores to find products that they can use to build their products. Because every domain at, uh, at Roach is building products, not just from... Well, actually, each domain manages a source system. He also said that, which was interesting. Uh, but each domain builds products from other products that domains are making available. So I think what I'll say here is uh, uh, there's not just one data store, potentially many stores with an Uber store on top. 
Yeah, maybe we call it a data shopping mall. <laughs> well, that's interesting because way, way, way back when the industry was enamored, first enamored with portals, uh, and there was not a name for it, I tried to create a name for what became known as portals, and I call it information malls. <laughs> And, there you go. And you can see what won out, not that. But maybe it's time to resurrect the information mall. Be. What do you call it? A data shopping mall? Data shopping mall? Data shopping mall. All right. You got one from the audience? I have one that's kind of a, I think it's a consensus in my view, and, and I forget who originally said it, but Data fabric and data mesh are symbiotic. And wait, this might have come from you. Well, yeah, this was you. You said the both different ways to manage distributed data. The fabric is technical and the mesh is organizational or sociological, depending on how you look at it. I think I saw within our panelists heads nodding about that. A lot of the challenge centers on the sociological aspect of this, the organizational processes and so forth which I think is why blood pressure tends to rise with data mesh discussions in particular. You know, I'm a skeptic of data mesh because it sounds like, you know, we're endorsing data silos, but there are good things that the data mesh has brought. And as I said, I think it's, it, it and Fabric are making, helping us understand what it really takes to deliver self-service, right? And organ, you know, having the right organizational model that I think has to be federated is really important. So I think that's the key contribution of uh, data mesh. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely agree. Okay, so yeah, I, I can agree with that. And, so, right. and it, it kind of gets to um, organizational aspect of the mesh. I liked what Paul Rankin said, that 10% um, of the challenge is technical, 90% sociological. Oh. Well, let's write that I one believe down. those are his numbers. Yeah, Rankin says 90% uh, of the challenge is sociological. That's the right term. I would say it's more like organizational and cultural, wouldn't you say that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I would say that. So also what I was trying to say was that, you know, the data mesh and fabric have, have helped people realize, help people realize what it takes to deliver self-service. And it's not just a tool. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. I, I think it's important. No, I think, I think you've articulated it well. Yeah. And I think this was good. Uh, so it, a related point is that data products need to offer. This is a point that um, Casey made. Data products need to give views of lineage, usage patterns, and their relationships with other products. It made me think of um, a, a sophisticated shopper on um, Amazon or other consumer scenarios where you're buying something that's in this case kind of premium you need to read some user reviews you need to dig into understanding how the product was made how it's different from or related to other types of products so it gets down back to your original analogy Wayne of data product really being a product and you need to apply similar standards to it so that notion of lineage usage and relationships to other products is important yeah, and that I think that rings up what I was saying about layers of metadata, because some of that metadata yeah. create the asset, some comes when you publish it to a catalog, uh, and all that gets carried into the into a data store or marketplace, um, if you have one. Some other things. Now we got some comments here from uh, Matthew of. Uh, Community data products demand data management. Um, excuse me, data products demand product management. And yeah, that's, that's true. In fact, Paul Rankin was saying he didn't say this in his Q and A, but 
he told me in another point, having uh, getting people to have a product mindset is one of the biggest challenges. Um, there was definitely discussion of a product mindset, but agree completely that this requires a rethinking of how to really productize your data. Yeah. And Wayne, I liked um, in your initial slides, you talked about how it's a it has all the characteristics, the data store of people who buy and sell products from others that they don't know. And you so like that? <laughs> I did like that because I, it that's, raises that's kind the of bar. Controversial, though. I know. I'm not sure everyone is going to buy into that. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it raises the bar about the level, the quality of what you put into the marketplace. Yeah. I'm curious, those of you who are listening, uh, for my own personal benefit, do, do you think that 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 statement makes sense? Um, I have another one we can add here. Are you uh, typing something? Like... Oh, your turn. Okay. I think that this is another comment actually from Casey. You asked the <laughs> unavoidable question about generative AI right. and where all this inter intersects with um, language models, especially what what we're calling, I'm calling the emergence of small language models that are much more domain specific, trained or prompted or fine tuned based on enterprise data. And so I, I liked what Casey said that Data Fabric has the potential to provide um, these generative AI, these small language models, the full data access, the data quality and the explainability that they need. Yeah, because otherwise your gen AI is just pulling from much smaller single domain, right? Smaller data set, single domain. Yeah. Um, All right, we're testing the bounds of what Google. You know what I heard? That the last question I asked to the panel, uh, it was surprising to see people come up with the same answer, which is that the days of you know centralized IT are done. Well, I kind of think we all know that already, right? I mean. IT's job is really to facilitate, ideally. I mean, it's still there's still a lot of domains out there, if you want to call them that, or departments that really just have no interest in building anything for themselves or building products. They want it all handed to them, right? So I would just say days of centralization, IT centralization, um, are over. IT must, must facilitate, not dictate. Yeah, and so Paul's Paul Rankin's comments were quite interesting. He said that due to M and A, due to the preference of R and D departments that know the data better than central IT, they were already eighty percent decentralized anyway. Oh yeah. So oh, his right. term was why bother trying to centralize? And I believe that uh, a reason that the that data mesh cool. has has really struck a chord with so many folks is it's perhaps a sense of relief for enterprises that have been fighting decentralization trends for years. And finally, the data mesh says, let's let's accept that trend and let's try to make the best of it. Yeah, yeah, it is true. You know, if you can't beat them, join them. In Roach's case, it actually works because it's a good cultural fit, right? I think the most impressive thing about the Rankin case study or the Roach case study is that they got way out in front of the data mesh. Before they introduced this, I think they built that self-service data platform. I mean, that doesn't usually happen. How long does it take to build out a data warehouse platform before people start to use it? It never gets built out, right? So somehow we got way out in front and built that platform before, or at least you know, coterminously with the introduction of the data mesh and, you know, that, that's one reason I've always, well, I like the data fabric so much is that you can implement a data fabric in a couple of weeks and instantaneously it will inject agility into your standard centralized data management environment. So I'm going to add these things here. Uh, and I also put that, uh, which was impressive, getting out in front of its... Data mesh with a first. Yeah, Paul talked about 
28 teams and over 300 data products operationalized. Fantastic. Yeah, that's impressive. I did ask him. He came to our topic table, the Eckerson Group topic table. Oh, great. And, and he said his domains are more like groups, and typically each group is managing a source system already, like Salesforce. Right. And so they've already got developers who are familiar with that data and it's their responsibility to create products from that data for themselves and for other people and to share it in their data store that other people have access to. So that's and I know they've hired out, you know, offshore people to kind of flesh out these uh, domain teams and start building data products. And that's one reason they're building so many is that they've they're doing it overseas. You know? <laughs> Um, yeah. 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 So Wayne, I got another one here and it's actually related to generative AI. I thought Rick had a great comment. I think he was following up on Casey's observation about the data fabric. I, I got, wrote this down because I thought it was perfect. Um, without data products, generative AI is just going to be trouble. Yeah. Um, and, and I agree. I think that you have to apply high standards, governance standards, um, among other things, to uh, to data in order to make sure that you're feeding and training and prompting and fine-tuning those language models with uh, data you can trust. Yeah, I think, you know, the when it comes down to it, the data product, the whole movement is about creating trustworthy data products. Uh, or data set, da anything, data assets, right? I mean, because so, in so many companies, people don't trust the data, the data assets that are given to them, right? And that's been a huge problem forever and ever. And I think people are seeing data products as a way finally get around that. Uh, I didn't say this, or no one said this, but I think it, it kind of feeds off of what you just said. You know, the biggest issue that most people are struggling with and the way and reason we find, you know, we implement new products and adopt new architectures <laughs> is one, to address data quality issues and data bottlenecks, right? And those pain points are perennial. Um, and anything that we do that can address those and, and minimize those, and mitigate those is a good thing, whatever tool, whatever architecture, whatever organizational approach. And I think, you know, data fabric, data mesh, they're all essentially trying to address these things, right? Uh, data product with improved data quality, you know, a data mesh eliminates data bottlenecks by kind of putting the development at the domain. So we've got some great comments here. Casey points out that uh, maybe the shopping mall is not quite as futuristic as we're looking for. He says, for those of us in California, all of our malls have closed. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Uh, maybe we no, should so, think of things. So, so that buzzword's uh, not gonna not gonna last. Maybe the Amazon <laughs> rather than shopping. Well, malls. I heard they're turning uh, shopping malls today, or at least part of them, into pickleball because because <laughs> people don't want to listen to pickleball, you know, in their neighborhood, you know, because it make a racket. Uh, and there people you go. Play, play indoors all year round. So, um, so Dan Siokin, hopefully I'm pronouncing his name right, at uh, Infosys, I believe, is, is suggesting maybe data quagmire. I like quagmire. <laughs> Quicksand. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got um, another, another, another key takeaway. I think this is cool. I, I think the future of data products is virtual data products. Uh, and we had an interesting discussion on that. Yes. You know, I was saying it just gives a lot more flexibility to the consumer who can kind of dissect the data product and, and get just what they want from it instead of having to take the whole thing or combine data products uh, on the fly. You can't do that with fixed products like files and things, not, not as easily. And then Matt mentioned that, you know, the virtual product enables you to move the data on the back end without affecting what users actually see. So it's kind of that that shielding users from complexity of the back end and uh, you know changes in the back end. I roll here. I got four in a row here. Uh, no, I got a bunch. I'm gonna I'm gonna rely on. <laughs> I've got a couple others, but um, I thought Dr. Sue Tripathi at IBM here had a great uh, point here. Aligning to to optimize the fabric and mesh, one must align with the business strategy. Oh, yeah, and uh, to another success factor is 
embedded change management and, and, and what the clarity is on the added value of data fabric and data mesh. So Wayne, you talked at the outset about uh, ensuring you have um, executive endorsement. And so I think that there, there are kind of two things. One is making sure that you're aligning with business objectives and business strategy. Another is that when you get into implementation, you wanna uh, have uh, change management processes that, that will be feasible. Yeah. Oops. And then uh, I think another point that came from the commentary and I brought up in the panel was uh, alignment with the data lake. And there definitely are synergies with data lake elements and the data fabric, data mesh and, and products, because while the focus of fabric and mesh is distributed data, uh, the reality is a lot of organizations have consolidated at least some of their business data in um, into uh, data lake. And so, so what's the, the take lake can certainly contribute to that. Is the takeaway that the fabric and mesh supplement the data lake or is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, the, the fabric and mesh can draw upon the capabilities of the data lake and lake house. I said data fabric supplements, data lake, data warehouse. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. It, it's a symbiotic relation term. Well, Mesh is trying to kill those things. <laughs> well, yeah, but I think a lot of organizations have, and we found this with our um, our research with Bark last year, a lot of organizations will have multiple lakes, multiple data warehouses. Yeah. So you might have a business unit that's consolidated into one lake and another business unit that's done similar things with their division. Yeah. So Dr. Phil Hendricks, I think a great point. Data products, oftentimes you're talking about co-ownership. They need, they should be co-owned, prioritized and have their value measured by their impact and contribution to key stakeholder goals. That's a good point. We talked about alignment with business objectives, with business strategy, but part of the granular metadata associated with the data product should probably be how do you federate at their ownership and how do you map it back to business objectives? Okay. Type that in there, Wayne. I'm doing it. Okay, yeah. excellent. I see. I'll yeah, stuff. that's right. Data, data products should be co-owned, prioritized, and have their value measured according to their, I'm synthesizing a little bit here, according to their contribution to business objectives. Uh, Casey had one more point, which is uh, discover, build, and govern data products all in one environment, which I agree with. That's a little self-serving because that's what its product does, but <laughs> I do think everybody needs that, you know? That is a data fabric to me, so. Um, Great discussion. I learned a lot and really appreciate everyone joining and contributing. Wayne, I think this is broken records for us in terms of registrants and also audience participation. So I'll close out by saying thank you, but also that there does seem to be this huge trend towards decentralization. And with luck, the industry is going to get more scientific about how to play that to its advantage. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. I think we just hit the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think we're going to need to drill down on this a lot more. I think the industry is going to learn a ton in the next six, nine months. So maybe we come back then with all fresh new set of uh, decks and, and people to discuss these issues. Thank you everyone okay. for attending and sticking out to the bitter end here and contributing your thoughts and ideas. Very fun. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you, Kevin.